Our final agenda item is the faculty spotlight that we instituted a few months ago. And Bill Fisher has graciously agreed to be in the faculty spotlight this evening. So Bill, we're looking forward to hearing about your journey as a scholar in in whatever way you would like to um, tell us about that. <laughs> At least somebody's looking forward to it. No, I'm um, definitely <laughs> looking forward to it. Do you, um, do you need to share your screen? No, I don't. Okay, so, all right, um, I'll take it away. Okay, so um, this is my sort of uh, journey slash life in the academy. And um, to start this trip, if you will, we need to go back to September of 1968, which I realize some of you may not have even have been born by then. But um, since September of 1968, with the exception of four months at the end of 1973, I have been in one capacity or another affiliated with one uh, institution of higher education or another, uh, you know, to today. Um, so that's well over 50 years. And, you know, just looking at those numbers, one might think that I was, you know, just meant to be uh, in the academy. But in point of fact, um, it, it was anything but. And, in you know a little while you'll 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 learn how I ended up here. Um, so September of 1968 was when I started college, if you will, as a freshman, and I started at a small private school uh, not too far from home, and um, it was a four-year school, and I was essentially using it as a community college because um, I. I lived in and grew up at that point in time in Arkansas in the only two year schools uh, in the late sixties in Arkansas were um, uh, what Pat may be familiar with. They were technical schools, not uh, community colleges as we understand them today and um, not wanting to be either an electrician or a plumber. Uh, that was not a good academic option for me. So I went to this small school to sort of learn how to be a student and figure out how a, a college or university works. And the idea being that um, I'd have more, uh, fewer students, more access to faculty uh, and things like that. So I used it uh, for two years. And in my um, start of my junior year, I transferred to uh, Georgetown University, which is located in um, our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. And I was a student in Georgetown School of Foreign Service because my first career choice, the first career choice I recall making sort of as a quasi thinking adult was to be a diplomat. I was going to, you know, eventually be Secretary of State and um, save the world um, from itself or whatever. And so Georgetown was one of a handful of schools that actually had a program in foreign service at that time. And I uh, got admitted to that program and felt great about it. Now, those of us in, in the U.S. may well have heard the term uh, the, the Beltway, uh, which refers to a series of roads uh, that essentially encircle our nation's capital. And there's the idea of things inside the Beltway and things outside the Beltway. And my view was I wanted to be a diplomat from what I knew and understood from outside the Beltway. And so I get to Georgetown, in, and it's now September of 1970, and now I'm inside the Beltway. And it didn't take me too long to figure out that not being you know, a fifth generation graduate of Yale or not having someone in my immediately, immediate family having donated millions of dollars to someone's Senate campaign or even better presidential campaign, the chances of me getting into a position where I could actually 
help make policy, set policy, and, and determine uh, the course of our, our foreign relation policy uh, were slim and none. Um, you know, the realities of inside the Beltway. So uh, the, um, the decision then was, do I stay at Georgetown and change majors, or do I go somewhere else and regroup? And Georgetown was also a private school. And at the time, tuition was, uh, I thought, extremely high. It's probably still very high. It's still a private school. And so I decided that um, to change majors and stay at Georgetown wasn't worth the money. And I, um, I was on um, a sort of, uh, you know, my father's dime, if you will. He had uh, told his children that he was good for four years of school, and uh, that was pretty much it. So trying to transfer in the middle of your junior year is not probably the smartest thing in the world you could do. And I um, figured the only place that I could had a, had a decent shot at getting in was to go to the University of Arkansas, uh, since I was a resident of the state. And I had, you know, fairly decent grades and all that other kind of good stuff. So I didn't see how they could say no, uh, even though later I learned that they could have. Um, but there was some information they didn't have at the time. So I did get admitted. And uh, so midway through my junior year, I'm at the University of Arkansas and I am a history major, which I had been initially at that at that school small school for two years uh, a history major as some of our previous speakers had also identified themselves uh, so I, I majored in history at Arkansas but I also um, since I had most of my uh, general ed requirements done I took a, a lot of courses in political science so I actually had a, ended up with a double major of history and political science and most of those political science courses focused on um, government at the state or local level. Uh, what probably uh, Arkansas, as I recall at the time, did not have a, a specific public administration um, degree or program. And so that was my focus. You know, I was disillusioned with government at the federal level, uh, but not necessarily at the uh, state or local level and thought that I still might be able to have uh, an impact in that regard. Um, I also, as, as a lot of history majors did, as I uh, settled in and, and, and uh, met some people, uh, a, a potential career option for me uh, was to go to law school. Uh, so I took the LSAT, the law school uh, admissions test, and did okay on that. And in talking with some people from the law school, and I had a good friend who was a, a student in the law school, um, I was told that I could probably uh, get admitted to law school at the University of Arkansas, and I could become what they, what they uh, described as, quote, a country club lawyer, unquote which essentially meant that I'd be in some medium-sized community, probably in Arkansas or, or one of the neighboring states, um, have a, a practice, uh, make enough money that I could join the country, join a country club if there was one. And that's where I would um, sort of mingle with my clients or find clients or, or what have you. Um, but I wanted to be a country club lawyer, probably about as much as I wanted to be an electrician or a plumber so I, in fact, did not apply it to law school. Um, you know, then what do I do? So in, in thinking about um, what I, uh, what exactly I wanted to do and the people that it had any kind of impact or influence on my life, um, you know, in, in first place was my father. Um, but once, you know, we got down to the, spot two, three, or what have you, it occurred to me that everybody else um, was from the academy. And most of them were um, history instructors. Uh, one of the good things about that small school was I did 
get to uh, talk with and, and knew some history instructors there. And in fact, wrote to one after I had gotten back from Georgetown to ask it, him what his life was like in, in his road to um, being a history uh, professor. And he was still working on his PhD while he was teaching at that small school. So, and he, God bless him, he took the time to uh, give me a, a very thorough and thoughtful response. Uh, there were some professors at the University of Arkansas that were all also very helpful. Uh, so, you know, that was it. You know, decision made, I was going to be a history professor. Um, almost, almost end of story. Um, and then to do that, of course, I needed to get a graduate degree uh, or graduate degrees, I should say, in history. So um, in addition to the LSAT, I took the GRE and I took actually I took the advanced test in history and the advanced test in political science because it's always nice to have a backup and um, applied for and got admitted to the master's program in history at the, at the University of Arkansas. Uh, but my four years uh, were up on, on Papa Fisher's dime. So I also needed some income. And, uh, you know, over the years I had, you know, had part-time jobs here and there and had made a little money, but certainly not enough to even pay tuition, uh, let alone uh, provide for myself. So at, at the time, uh, what they had at Arkansas were called graduate assistantships. Um, and they came in a number of different um, versions, if you will. And there were two assistantships that I applied for. Um, one was uh, an assistantship with the history department uh, to be a research assistant. Uh, Arkansas actually had just started a PhD program in history. So most of it was master's students. And so we weren't teaching assistants um, because we couldn't teach, go in and have a course, an entire course to ourselves for a full semester. Um, so there was uh, an assistantship open in the history department that I was very interested in. And the other assistantship was um, to work in one of the residence halls, which I had actually done my senior year. Uh, so I had uh, managed to um, exchange some labor for room and board, if you will. Um, and the graduate assistantship was uh, room and board for a year and a monthly stipend. So I, I did both, applied for both, um, did whatever interviews uh, were there. And of course, because I was very interested in history assistantship, uh, I got the one in the residence hall. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you never count on getting what you want, at least initially. Um, I was told that uh, somebody else got the history assistantship, which was all well and good, and actually somebody I knew. Uh, so that was that. I started uh, graduate school in, in the summer. I had, you know, between the time I graduated Arkansas with a BA degree and started the master's program, I had 10 days to two weeks of, of quote, vacation. I went home and did laundry and went back to, to Fayetteville. Um, so I had a few courses under my belt and um, the fall semester starts and I'm the graduate assistant in this residence hall, which essentially meant I was like the number two person in charge of a nine story building that had between six and 700 uh, young men away from home, many of them for the first time, who wanted to try to push that new freedom about as far as they could push. Um, and I was there, uh, as well as other people, to help push back, I guess. Um, so the fall semester starts, and it's like the first or second week of school, and I'm over around the history offices, and one of, one of my professors says, has Dr. Chase talked to you yet? And Dr. Chase being the uh, chair of the history department. And I go, no, he has not. And he said, well, you need to go talk to him. Uh, we've been told uh, if we see you to send you to him. And, it, you know, that was 
almost like being sent to the principal's office. And I'm going, what, you know, what the hell did I do now? And so I go and find Dr. Chase. And um, he tells me that the guy that got the assistantship is not going to be in school for this fall semester. He had some uh, family issue and was taking a semester off. Did I want the history assistantship for one semester? And, you know, I, I told him that was a very intriguing offer. Uh, I also told him that I had the job in the dorm and that I had heard that you could only have one assistantship at a time. And he, you know, the things we learned, he, he didn't even bat an eye. He said, you let me worry about the, the rules and the procedures. Do you want the assistantship or not? And I said, yes, I do. Um, so he asked me, you know, what I was, my course load, because now he knew I had this other, um, uh, commitment and I told him, you know, I had a full load of classes and he said, well, you know, if this comes through, he goes, he goes, I got to check and make sure, but I think I can make this happen, but I want you to drop a class so you don't get overwhelmed and you have time to commit to everything, including the classes that you'll still have. And I said, okay, that, that, you know, I was trying to finish the master's degree as quickly as I could because I needed to get somewhere to get a job, to be able to afford to get the PhD um, so I could teach history. But I figured, you know, one more, you know, uh, the first uh, term of the summer, uh, to finish things up with one class won't be the end of the world. And the immediate thought I had was I can be a, um, a freshman orientation counselor, which was probably the most prestigious student job on campus uh, where they, they choose, a, I forget now if there were 14 or 16 uh, summer orientation counselors, half male, half female, and they did an on-campus orientation throughout the summer, uh, bringing in uh, uh, you know maybe a hundred students at a time, two and a half days. You know they they show the first group showed up Sunday evening, and by Tuesday morning they were gone, or, or Wednesday morning they were gone. And another group we started Wednesday afternoon, and they left on Friday. Um, and so. I said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll be an orientation counselor and that'll get me a little more money and, and, and this and that and the other. Um, so I did the, um, I did the both assistantships. He, he did figure out how to make it happen. So don't listen to rules. That was something I learned, um, you know, at least give it a try and wait until two or maybe three people tell you it can't happen uh, and then try a fourth. Um, so I did that, you know, the, the fall semester went well. Uh, I had a good, uh, the professor I was, I was uh, working with was very good. He was an assistant professor, had been there for a little while. And um, he gave me a, a lot of good information about getting a PhD in history, uh, what it was like, uh, this and that and the other, very interesting. He was actually an Ohio State graduate. He had gotten his PhD there. And his, his best piece of, of uh, his best recommendation to me was don't go to Ohio State. Um, because uh, his, his thinking was, he said, you know, there were over 200 PhD history students when I was there. And, you know, everybody's jockeying for attention and, uh, you know, FaceTime with the same set of instructors and this and that and the other and goes, go somewhere smaller, go somewhere where you'll have access to your instructor. Um, and he did not recommend Ohio State um, or he said any large, he said, check, make sure, look at the numbers, don't go any place like that. Um, so I, you know, put that in the data bank, um, made it through that first year, did apply for to be an orientation counselor um, and, and then realized just how competitive it was. I, I've kind of given it away that I did in fact get that job. But um, when I interviewed, 
for that job, they were interviewing eight of us at one time. And that was not the only group that interviewed. So that's how much of a demand there was for these positions. But uh, of that, of the eight that were in that room at that time, I was the only one that was chosen. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, met up with my other uh, colleagues and we started the summer, uh, you know, almost the, the week after classes ended. And the reason um, uh, this is important is, you know, we, we had our first group in, so it's like Monday morning and we get through whatever our set activities were. Um, it's lunchtime. Most people are up in the dining hall uh, having lunch and I've never been a big lunch eater. So um, while we were upstairs, downstairs in the main area and they were using one big um, residence hall to, to do most of this stuff, um, the people were sitting up because the main activity for the afternoon was representatives from the different units on campus were there and people could, if you had no idea what you wanted to do, you could go and talk to people you know, from the psychology department, from the history department, from the, the biology department, et cetera. Um, and if you were interested in biology, then you could go and just really find out what, what the course load was like and requirements and this and that and the other. So it was all the academic advising. So I go down to see if I can help out in any way, shape or form and somehow or another end up um, working with helping um, the one guy that was in there, uh, who was wearing a suit and tie and he ended up being, uh, the Dean of one of the colleges, um, at Arkansas. And I am extremely embarrassed to, to tell you, I don't remember the gentleman's name, nor do I remember the academic unit he was the Dean of. Uh, although I can tell you for my San Jose colleagues, it was comparable to our CASA, to Applied Sciences and Arts, because uh, this guy had a uh, recreation background. That was his, um, that was his academic uh, unit, if you will. So I'm helping him get ready to get set up. And he's chatting to me, you know, like any good academic does with a student. What's your name? What's your major? What are you going to do with yourself? Um, so I got the first two right. And for question number three, I looked at him and I said, well, you know, I'm not entirely sure. And he said, so this gentleman turns to me after a couple minutes of conversation and he said, have you considered library science? And, you know, part of me is thinking you need a degree to work in a library. And I, I, you know, so I look at him and I go, no, I have not. Um, and he said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly, you know, I don't know what the right word is because a lot of people with history background go there because they, they have the research skills from their history degree and they get jobs at university campuses and they help people with their research. And I go, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. Um, you know, what else can you tell me about this new profession that I just learned about? Um, and that was about it. But uh, not only did this guy know about units that weren't in his college, uh, he, I think, knew everybody on campus because he said, if you want more information, there's a woman in our College of Education that actually teaches some library science courses and this is her name and i'm even more embarrassed that i don't remember that woman's name and i thanked him very much and he continued getting set up and i went to help some other people get set up and you know so there's this sort literally a chance encounter that maybe took all of 10 minutes and now i kind of have a potential new career field. Uh, so we get through the orientate the um, academic advising section. It's now three or three thirty on a Monday or Tuesday afternoon, the first week of summer. 
and we have some free time uh, before dinner and the the evening um, programs that we had for our orientation students. So I decided to wander over to campus and find the education building and uh, check out this woman's office and at least find out where it is. And so I go look at the directory, see what floor she's on, get up to that floor. And lo and behold, there was like one door partly open and one light on in one office and it was her. And so I go knock on the door and uh, so pardon me, you know, Dr. So-and-so, do you have a minute? And her response to me was, well, that's about all I've got. You know, I'm trying to finish putting stuff away from, from the year um, and, and get out of here. My kids are out of school now and we're leaving on vacation tomorrow morning. And so I tell her who I am. I just talked to, you know, Dean so-and-so and I'm interested in library science. And you know, like like a, a true academic, you know, time slowed down for this woman right after I said that. Told her I was interested in library science. She sat down. I sat down. We started talking a little bit. And she told me three things. Uh, one of which may well have been true at the time, but by the time I've <clears throat> By the time it was going to do me any good, it was not. And that was that there was a shortage of people in the field. And there may have been at one time, but not by the time I graduated. Um, the other thing she did, uh, and some of you may be old enough to remember, uh, because before we had this internet thing, we had this stuff called paper. And she handed me this brochure, which was nothing more than a a regular eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, turn sideways, trifold. And that was the list of accredited programs in the United States and Canada. So this is a big day because I just learned about a new profession and I learned a new word, accreditation. And she hands me this list and says, you know, if you're going to go to school to get a library degree, you want to go to one of these. I go, okay. And then uh, the third thing she said was, if you should consider either going north to Missouri, west to Oklahoma, or south to uh, Louisiana State, because since there is no accredited program in Arkansas, if you go to one of those three programs, they will waive your out-of-state tuition because you don't have an in-state option. And I said, oh, OK, that's good to know. And I thanked her and, you know, maybe I was with her all of 15 minutes um, and went back and did some other stuff and then started looking through this information and thinking about this later that evening and uh, later through that week. And so, you know, plan A had been to be a history professor. So now I was coming up with plan a.1, which was um, because the, the other thing she told me was most of these programs were a year long, in and out, one year, 12 months, boom, you got a master's degree and you can go get a job, of which she thought there were plenty. Uh, so now plan A.1 is go to library school for a year, get a job at a university campus work in the library, get a PhD in history um, at that university, because I'm still going to be a history professor, um, library science or not. So, um, you know, new plan, felt good, uh, learned some new words, started looking at the list uh, and ended up not going to Missouri, Oklahoma or LSU. I actually ended up going to a uh, uh, reasonably small uh, school, part of the SUNY system, State University of New York uh, system, in a very small community called Geneseo, New York, which is in Western upstate New York. And there were more, this, the campus population was bigger than the community population. But I went there um, partly because their curriculum looked somewhat intriguing. 
And the guy that had run the dorm where I worked when I was a senior at Arkansas was now there running a dorm while his wife was getting a graduate degree at Geneseo. He had been working on his degree at Arkansas. Now it was his wife's turn to get a degree. And Geneseo did, in fact, have a couple of, of uh, all, almost nationally recognized degrees. And I, plus, I had never been to that part of the world. And I figured, you know, 12 months, what the heck? Um, I'll get up there, look around, uh, see part of the country that I've never seen before. So I apply for and get admitted to um, SUNY Geneseo in their School of Library Science. Uh, I'm not even sure it was Library and Information Science at that point. Um, and this is January of 1974. So it was from when I left Arkansas that summer. Uh, so it was September, October, November, December. Those were the four months that I was not affiliated with a university campus. Now, I um, worked those four months, worked a couple different jobs, and in fact, worked for my father um, because I had worked for him off and on before in the summers and this and that and the other. My father um, was in the apparel industry. He, he had a, a factory uh, made um, women's apparel. And I, I should say um, that, uh, you know, sort of lingering there in the background, if you will, uh, a career option had always been, uh, he owned his own company and I was the oldest son. So, you know, option number whatever was always to learn the business and take over my father's company. But I really had no desire to do that. And, and I can remember, oh, at least three different um, conversations where, you know, the offer was made and I told him I wasn't interested. Uh, and he still continued to be my father, uh, which shows you, you know, just how nice a guy he, he was. Um, so anyway, I, I worked for him for uh, some months. And because I was also living under his roof, I, I put a lot of money together, which was good. And um so I was going to go off to Geneseo and I was going to do this all on my own. So I get up there and get to campus a couple days before classes begin and I get registered. And um, when I had sent my application material in, I had mentioned that I had a, a research assistantship with the history department at Arkansas and was interested if there was any opportunity like that at, at uh, Geneseo. So you know, I, I get registered, uh, which was a bit of a shock because the out-of-state tuition was a little more than I had figured. Um, and now I really needed a job because the bank account was a little more depleted than I thought it was going to be. So I go over to the dean's office for the library school and um, walk in, you know, you know mid-morning and talk to his secretary and I go, is the dean here? Uh, you know, because I figured he also needed to know who I was because I was obviously gonna be one of his more important students. Um, so the secretary says, well, he's in with another student right now, you know, have a seat when he gets done. Uh, he does have a meeting at such and such a time and, uh, but I think he'll have time to talk to you. And I go, okay, thanks. Um, 10 minutes later, the door opens, Student walks out, Dean comes out, I meet the Dean, we go into his office, uh, tell him who I am, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, what's the possibility of getting an assistantship? And the Dean looks at me and I think he finds my file and, and takes a look at that. And he looks at me and he said, the student who just walked out of here. Uh, I go, yes, because she had been my research assistant. She was here to tell me she had gotten another job and was no longer my research assistant. So go out and the secretary will give you the paperwork because now you're my research assistant. So, um, you know, either it was either being in the right place at the right time or it was pure dumb luck. I haven't quite figured out what it was. You know, it was almost the same thing at Arkansas with the dean and the, and the education woman. Uh, so I went out, you know, did the paperwork and um, 
also found out that if you're a graduate assistant at SUNY Geneseo, they uh, waive out-of-state fees. So a lot of the money I had given them the day before, they gave back to me. And now I figured I could make it, um, you know, get the degree without um, having to ask my father for any more money and admit that defeat, if you will. And um, the other thing was I got to work with the dean uh, directly. So I kind of got a sense of how an academic department runs, uh, certainly how a, a library school runs. And that program was up for accreditation the next year. I was going to be gone by then, but a lot of the paperwork and stuff that's now all automated uh, and put together, I won't say fairly easily, uh, but you know, systematically was put together by going through file by file and, and this and that and the other, and was put together by hand. And um, for some of that data, it was my hands that were putting that information together. So I learned about what accreditation was and I learned how serious uh, it was and how serious these programs took it, which of course became um, important later on. So as the expression goes, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Um, yeah, it was, you know, I went up there with the idea that, you know, I was going to get in, get out, learn, you know, the minimum of what I needed to learn and move on because I was still going to be a history professor. Um, but, you know, the funny thing that happened on the way to that forum was I kind of enjoyed the courses and found some of this stuff intriguing and actually went out of my way not to take a library history course because, heck, I had a master's degree in the field and I could find that stuff out on my own. And besides, if I was going to work in the field, you know, there were probably some things I needed to know. So, you know, then I started thinking because half of the instructors I had were longtime uh, librarians who had master's degrees but did not have PhDs. And the writing was on the wall that if they had to apply for their job again, they would need a PhD. So plan you know, A.2, or better known as Plan B, you know, maybe I'll stay in the academy, maybe I'll teach, but maybe I'll teach this library stuff instead of history. And so I left Geneseo, um, and it was also important that I had a chance to work with the dean, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the job market was very, very tight uh, when I got out. Um, and I got my first job the good old fashioned American way. The library director knew the dean of the library school. And because I had been working with the dean, he was able to recommend me uh, to go down to South Florida. And my first professional position was at uh, Florida Atlantic University. And the problem with that was it was a small school and they did not have a, a PhD program in anything, or maybe they had, but I, nothing I was interested in, nor was there a school with a PhD program in library science anywhere around. So almost as soon as I got there, I started looking at other opportunities because I either needed to go work somewhere where I could commute and get a PhD in library science or work somewhere where I could make a lot of money uh, over a short period of time and then go to school full time. Uh, but remember, this is library science. So that second option uh, wasn't going to work very well. Um, so I ended up going from um, South Florida to Southern California. Uh, there was a position open at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And at that time, the P, there was only one choice, really, a PhD program at the University of Southern California, not the current PhD program that's there, um, but the original uh, LIS program that was at USC. So I, I get out to California, uh, start working at Dominguez Hills, uh, meet some people, 
in the profession there mention I'm going to go to um, um, meet some, uh, mention I'm going to go to USC and everybody says, no, wait, 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 there's a PhD program, UCLA starting a PhD program, uh, you know, it, it, more academic rigor there, you should you should wait and go to the PhD, uh, start your PhD program at UCLA. Uh, well, you know, patience and waiting has never been my strong suit. So I started USC and it was part time. So it was five years, Anthony. Um, actually, it was just a little over five years, uh, to tell you the truth. Um, but I made a big flow chart when I started and just missed that graduation deadline. Uh, but the the interesting thing, no, part time, Letty, part one, one class a semester, um, fall, summer and um, what's the spring, because uh, it's not like our program. Uh, we had a minimum number of courses. And then we did our qualifyings and then we spent uh, time working on our dissertation, which most people figured oh, was three to four years worth of classwork. And then a couple years um, for, the, uh, for the dissertation. Uh, but, you know, long story short, I finished uh, USC. I was on the faculty uh, at UCLA, and that was my first teaching position. And I was there as an assistant professor at UCLA to shake the hand of the first PhD graduate uh, that came out of that program. Uh, so, you know, another uh, either right place, right time, or pure dumb luck in not waiting around for UCLA uh, because they. Uh, I don't know enough about them currently to say this is still true, but they could be a little dysfunctional every now and then. Uh, but in any event, so I started at UCLA. I'm there for seven years. Uh, and then uh, UCLA, being part of the UC system, was very, very research oriented. Uh, and not only just research oriented, but very uh, theoretical research oriented. And that was not particularly where my interests and publications lay. So um, in 1988, um, they gave me an opportunity to look for other opportunities, uh, which was a nice way of saying they fired my ass. Uh, I did not get tenure at UCLA. And, um, you know, <laughs> A PhD in history was starting to look a little better, although that was not what I did. You know, I looked around, started applying for different things, and thank goodness, uh, I was a position open for fall of 88 at a state school in the Bay Area, uh, lovingly known as San Jose State University. Applied for that job, got that job, um, September of so we started in September of 1968, September of 1988, I hit campus uh, at San Jose and they haven't been able to get rid of me since. Um, so, you know, that's, that's been it. it uh, been some ups, there's been some downs. Uh, and again, I still don't know if it's, you know, just pure dumb luck or being in the right place at the right time or a combination of both, but, uh, yeah, there have been some very kind and helpful people um, around right when I needed them. And I uh, have uh, used those people um, as the time came and have been trying to do the same with other students um, and uh, faculty, uh, junior faculty um, um, since then. Uh, so Michelle's got a, a question uh, about how I got involved with special libraries. You know, <laughs> you know, the, how, the way all this stuff fits together is, is almost eerie. Uh, Michelle, I'm, I'm in uh, with Dean Robert Hayes of the UCLA Library School. Um, and I've done some of the group interviews and it was now just Hayes and myself in his office. And he asked me point blank, could I teach special libraries? And thank God I at least knew what 
what they were. Uh, and they did not have anybody full time on the faculty. And that had been a big rap against that program. And so I'm sitting there looking at him thinking to myself, the answer to this question is not no. And I think what I said to him was, well, probably not in the fall quarter, but if you give me a little while, I'll be able to put something together. And yeah, that was it. And I taught, I taught the special libraries in the spring quarter of UCLA, 10 weeks. Um, we were in the classroom, I think three weeks and did field visits seven weeks because I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Uh, by the time I left UCLA and still teaching special libraries, um, we were in the classroom 10 weeks and the, the students still had to do field trips, but they had to like organize themselves into groups and go do the field trips on their own because I had too much to cover and not enough class time to do it. So it was, you know, just a complete uh, turnaround. But, you know, again, uh, so I get this job at UCLA. I'm the special libraries guy. <clears throat> I'm in my office, maybe the second week of school, and a guy wanders into my office, and he was the um, architecture and urban planning librarian, and they had, the, they had a, a separate library at UCLA and he introduces himself and he says, my name's John Green, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm a SLA member. I understand you're teaching the special libraries class now. Uh, the local Southern California chapter at that time had liaison positions for faculty from USC and UCLA. He said, obviously, that'll be you now. Um, the, the board meets next Tuesday at Caltech. I'll drive. And that's, you know, that's actually then how I got involved with SLA. You know, the first part of the story was how I got involved with special libraries and I'm on the board. And I think pretty much, well, maybe not Dara, but I think everybody else knows me well enough to know that you put me in a group uh, of people and I cannot keep my mouth shut. So um, I started going to the board as the UCLA rep and uh, three years later, that was running for president of the Southern California chapter, uh, which which I did not win, <laughs> which I did not win. But uh, because somebody who'd been around forever and was far more deserving, um, won that election. So next year, they figured out that they ran me unopposed and I was vice president to her president. And that's how I got involved with with SLA and stuff. So it's just been, you know, one positive experience after another and wouldn't change any of it. And I'm, you know, one of those people that claims that I, I have never done a day's worth of work because I love what I'm doing too much. 